Let's take a look at Canon's EOS R6. I'm Ken Rockwell, and this is KenRockwell.tv. Let's first take a look at some of the pictures I can make with this. Here we have a fountain. This is shot in the EOS R6's square crop mode, which I love, much like my Hasselblad, gives me square images, which look fantastic when printed for in-person gallery shows. However, here in television, where we're running 16 by 9 doesn't quite fit. This is shot with the 100 to 500 millimeter LIS USM RF lens at 167 millimeters wide open at f5, handheld at a 250th at ISO 100 with minus 0.3 stops of exposure compensation. And this is exactly as it came out of the camera. This shot here, again, also in the square crop mode, which I'm doing my best here in video editing to make fit our screen as we pan around the still image. Also shot with the RF 100 to 500 millimeter LIS USM at 145 millimeters at f7.1, handheld at 1 400th at auto ISO 100 with minus 0.3 stops of exposure compensation. Here's a work that I call red flag warning. This is shot with the EF 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8 L2 on an EF to RF adapter at 65 millimeters at f11 handheld at a 125th at auto ISO 100 with minus 0.7 stops of exposure compensation. This is shot in the 4x3 crop mode. Again, I love these crop modes because I get the shots I can just deliver to clients straight out of the camera without having to edit them. And as you see, some shots like this just fit 4 by 3 for, especially for verticals, much better than they fit the standard, which is too tall. I shot this with the RF 24 to 240 millimeter IS at 62 millimeters at F8 handheld at 1 160th of a second at auto ISO 100 with minus 1.3 stops of exposure compensation. And this is what I got. And I'm zooming in here on the still image. This shot of a plant is also shot in the 4x3 crop mode, again with the RF 24 to 240 millimeter IS at 240 millimeters at F16, handheld at 1 60th of a second at auto ISO 500 with minus 0.3 stops of exposure compensation. Now, of course, there's very little in focus in this image, but what is in focus is ultra sharp. And I love the 24 to 240 millimeter lens for walking around and just seeing shots like this that I see when I'm out walking my dogs. Here are some palm trees. Again, back to the RF 100 to 500 millimeter LIS USM. This is a 223 millimeters at F7.1 handheld at 1 500th of a second at auto ISO 100 with minus 0.7 stops of exposure compensation. And again, here I'm panning down from the top to the bottom of this picture of trees. The thing I love about my R6 is just the color and the tones I get from it. In other words, the pictures I get look the way I want it to look. If you're looking about lenses, something Canon can do that no other company in the world has been able to do is offer a 50 millimeter F1 lens for full frame that's autofocus. Canon invented the 50 millimeter F0.95 back in 1961. It was manual focus. It was copied by Leica in 2008. Nikon copied it. Again, only manual focus, so it's purely a poser lens for their Z camera, Nikon's 58 0.95. But the world's first 50 millimeter f1.0 autofocus lens is this one right here, which you can easily get on eBay, which is where I got this one. And with the adapter, works flawlessly with the EOS R6. Actually, all of Canon lenses made since 1987, which are autofocus, work flawlessly on this adapter. One of the biggest selling features about this camera is its super high frame rate. This will run at 20 frames per second with a silent electronic shutter, the mechanical shutter mode, which is a nice, quiet mechanical shutter. And that sounds really good. And that shutter can shoot at 12 frames per second. You can use flash at 12 frames per second. I use my 580 EX2, which easily can run at 12 frames per second in short bursts if you're close enough so it's working at low enough power. And that's something you can't do on Sony or Fuji or anybody else because you can't shoot bursts at 12 frames a second with any of those cameras because they either have to revert to a electronic shutter, which won't work with flash, or the mechanical shutters just can't keep up. Another thing I love about my R6 and I have a separate video on the R6 versus the R5 is, I love having a real mode dial. This little rascal here, I just turn it and it's done. On the R5, it doesn't have a mode dial. It is a mode button surrounded by a control ring. And the only way to get this sucker to respond on the R5 is you have to hit this, wait for this to come up, and then try to adjust this. It looks simple here, but let's say I want to do C1. Where is, okay, there. It goes in the opposite direction. I don't like that. I much prefer this, where if I want C1, 
boom, there we go. What's new about this new camera is it is dual slots and it is dual SD card slots. The R5 has dual slots, but one of the slots is a CF Express, which is a very expensive kind of card. New is it offers five axis claimed sensor shift in body image stabilization, which I find gives about two stops of real world improvement with unstabilized lenses and eh, offers a little bit of extra improvement with stabilized lenses, but the real benefit of that is for unstabilized lenses. New is an HEIF image file format, but be careful. It's a new format, not that much software reads it. Be careful if you shoot an HEIF, be sure that whatever software you're using can read your own files. And if you're gonna send it to other people, be extremely careful. Don't assume anybody can read that unless you ask first. The advantage of the HEIF file format is that mathematically it's a little more elegant. You can store 10-bit images in about the same file space as 8-bit JPEGs. Other than that, I don't use it because it's not sufficiently standard for me. Also, of course, you have CR3 RAW. This dual pixel CMOS AF2 covers the entire frame for autofocus. Autofocus can detect people, mammals, and bird faces, and it figures out which one's which automatically. If you're still slumming it in Sony, you have to go in the menus, at least as of when I last looked, and today is uh, September 2020. You have to go in the menu and assign it either to look for animals or look for people. They can't just figure it out as the Canon camera can. New is an eight-way rear thumb nubbin which admittedly most other pro Canon cameras have had, but the EOS R and EOS RP have lacked this little thumb nubbin. Also new is a good old fashioned big dial on the back, which all Canon shooters know is actually the exposure compensation dial by default. It's not marked that way, but it is, but that's a nice tradition. The Q button and the magnify button are now separated. They used to be shared on other buttons. Does that matter? <laughs> not really. The new power knob adds a tab. The other power knobs were just knobs. You had to push them and then do this, but now that it has a tab, you can push it from the side without having to get some traction on it by pushing it this way. It seems like a minor point. There's the tab right there. That makes it a little better and easier to move. New is a clarity setting, which is separate from picture style. It's at menu, camera three. So we go to menu. Notice I programmed this red button to be my menu so I can control it with one. Go to camera three. And there, picture styles are the old standard picture styles you've had with Canon for years. Clarity is a new setting. Admittedly, I just leave it at zero. New is the option to turn the shutter to either remain open or closed when you turn off the camera. I prefer the default of being closed, but you can set that any way you want. And this, along with the R5 are the first cameras that can do that. That's at menu, wrench four. Wrench, wrench four, shutter at shutdown. Bingo, you can set it as you like, which is nice. You know, potato, potato, you can pronounce it your way. It, this does 4K video up to 59.94p, which most people call 60, but those of us who spent decades in television know that there's a huge difference between 59.94 and 60.00. And it does 1080 at up to 119.88p, which most people just call 120. And I think the menus in the camera call it 120 as well, which is confusing. But again, if you work in Hollywood, those are very different formats. And if you're shooting one and need the other, then you have to pay to get it converted. This will shoot 10-bit 422 video with Canon Log or HDRPQ. And I will admit, when I shoot video, I use a dedicated video camera. I shoot it on Panavision or Arri. I don't use the still camera to shoot videos. So I'm not going to cover video shooting with this camera. When I shoot video, I use my iPhone, which is what I'm using to shoot this video. You can internally record video with every format on these cards as is. New is a new battery. It's now called an LPE6NH which has a little bit more power in it, and it's cross-compatible with the LPE6N and the original LPE6. In fact, I've been shooting this camera all along with my Watson battery, which is the third-party battery, a little bit less ready to power, but to be honest, it works fine, and I've got some of these as well. Optional on this is a battery grip. The battery grip will work with two of those LPE6-style batteries. What's good about this camera? Everything. It's got plenty of resolution. 20 megapixels is more than enough for anything. Most people don't realize that even with a 4K display, even with a 4K 100-inch monitor, it still can't display more than 8 megapixels. That's all this has. So therefore, the electronics actually throw away all the extra pixels using various algorithms. You can never see more than 8 megapixels at once on an electronic display, at least as of today. So therefore, 20 megapixels is more than enough for anything, unless you're insane. Of course, marketers love to sell people more pixels than they need. Feel fine if you want to go buy the EOS R5, but 20 megapixels is more than enough. Another great thing about this camera is it has super fast and super smart edge-to-edge -edge autofocus tracking. If you want to shoot sports with this, it works great. It'll keep up at 20 frames per second. Of course, your lens needs to be fast enough to catch and focus that quickly. 
Unlike the EOS 1DX Mark III or any single reflex camera, this finder doesn't black out when you're shooting at high frame rates. It just stays bright. If you've shot the Pro EOS 1DX series of cameras that go 10, 12, 14, 16, whatever frames per second, the mirror is flapping like this and the image gets really blurry. It gets smeared vertically in the finder. No, this EOS camera works just great. The mechanical shutter is nice and smooth. It doesn't make that much noise. What does 12 frames per second sound like? It's hard to hear it on the internet here because the way this audio is processed, but let's give it a quick, quick listen at 12 frames per second. It's much quieter than the EOS 1DX series or any of the Pro SLRs. What's nice is there's a bulb timer, which you can use to time exposures out to 100 hours, and I'll show that in my how to use this guide video. In bulb, there's a minutes and seconds timer that shows, and even nicer than the R5, it shows here on the back screen and just counts up for as long as it needs to go. You can get live RGB histograms. Something you can't get on Nikon or Sony is that while you're shooting, there's a live RGB histogram, and that's before you've pressed the shutter. You can't get that on Sony or Nikon. With Sony or Nikon, you have to press the play button, by which time it's too late. The reason for that warning is, is you don't want to melt your shutter, so you want to keep the lens cap on, because with this F1 lens pointed at the sun, leave it on a picnic table, you'll have a melted shutter. It turns on very quickly, which is the way it should be. It seems minor, but I love that the cards face the correct way. The cards face me when I put them in the camera, and that's the way it should be. It's got C1, C2, and C3 modes. Right now with lockdown, I'm not photographing that many people, so C1 is for nature landscapes and most things that I shoot. C2 is the same thing, but I turn the brightnesses of the finder and the screen up all the way. And C3 is for tripods, so I actually lock it down to ISO 100 and a self-timer, set the JPEG image quality a little higher, and that's how I choose to shoot that. But again, look at my user's guide, which is a separate video and separate to online resource at KenRockwell.com. It's nice that it has several crop modes. I program my mother function button, the MFN button, to give me my crop modes. It can either do an APS-C crop, it can do a square crop, four by three. I don't use 16 by nine, but those are your options. And I have that program right at the mother function button. It's got Wi-Fi, it's got Bluetooth 4.2. It's about as weather sealed as a 6D series, which is okay, but it's not for shooting out in the pouring rain all day long like you can do with the 1DX Mark III. But guess what? I'm at the position of my career after all these years and decades that I don't have to stand out in the rain all day long, so I don't care. There's a little bit of a foam gasket here, but again, this is not an underwater camera, so I'm not trying to do that. Another great thing about everything Canon is, at least here in the United States, customer support is fantastic. Just call 1-800-OK-CANON. -OK You'll get an intelligent person who speaks fluent English and is a talented photographer and can answer pretty much any question you've got about using this camera right off the top of their head. The only bad things are, there's really nothing bad about this camera. The only bad thing is, is there is a rolling shutter effect. So if you're using the electronic shutter and swapping sideways like this, you can get things tilted a little bit left to right, in which case just use the mechanical shutter. And be sure to use super fast SD cards if you're really using 20 frames per second. This is the only camera I've used that gets a little clunky trying to play back the image if it's still trying to write them at the same time to the SD card. The buffer seems to choke a little bit. Although shooting isn't the problem. It's a matter of if you want to try to play things back before it's fully written to the card. What's missing? Well, there's nothing important missing, but I will say that the electronic shutter only goes to an 8,000th. Other electronic shutters will go to a 30,000th or 40,000th or 50,000th. There's no automatic brightness control for the rear LCD or for the finder, but I get over that by using C1 and C2, and that actually works better when I program C2 to be super bright than my Nikons or my Fujis, which do have automatic finder brightness control, but no automatic LCD brightness control because their automatic finder brightness controls are awful and are usually at the wrong brightness. There's no built-in flash. I love using flash. Those of you who have experience know that you want to use a fill flash in daylight for people pictures, and a lot of the time, people whine about dynamic range who are inexperienced photographers. What you do if you don't have enough light in your shadows, you pop up a flash, which is much better than trying to recover it electronically because you actually increase the contrast as shot. So I do miss the built-in flash. None of these buttons are illuminated, but almost no cameras are today. And the key is, the reason I complain about this is every phone I've had since the 1980s has had illuminated buttons for use at night. So uh, excuse me, uh, how come the Japanese haven't figured out how to illuminate their own buttons? Another great thing is this camera is made in Japan for the best possible quality. It's not offshored to China or, or some other country just to save the manufacturer money. Canon actually cares about us. They care about quality. They make it domestically. There's no voice recorder. The only camera that has a real voice recorder that's mirrorless is the EOS R5. Sony claims it in the A9 II, but it doesn't work well because you have to get to it from menus. So that doesn't count because that's for taking notes while you're shooting news. This will do 4K, but it doesn't do 8K DCI or 4K DCI. 
but you probably knew that already. It doesn't have a built-in GPS. That was a short-lived thing about 10 years ago in cameras. It doesn't have NFC. I don't even use NFC. If you want to get into the specifics of performance, as I covered at the very beginning, it has fantastic image quality, unbeaten frame rates, coupled with great autofocus, a great finder, and the industry's best ergonomics, speed, usability, and technical support. So there's nothing not to like. The only question is, do you want this or do you want the R5? Which again, separate video. Autofocus is fast. How fast it focuses from near to far depends on your lens. Oddly, the basic 24 to 240 millimeters focuses almost instantaneously, but some of the bigger lenses and faster lenses like the RF 85 millimeter F1.2 DS or just regular L focus more slowly because they need to get the precision. But what really makes the difference with this is that the autofocus system is smart enough to track all around the frame as things are moving around and track that. And that takes a lot of computing power and a lot of advanced technology. That's what this camera excels at. The RP doesn't do quite as great a job when you're tracking moving subjects. This camera tracks moving subjects marvelously well. Manual focus has the option of five or 10 times magnifier. It's got an in-finder distance scale and the option to use focus peaking, which again is all covered in my user's guide. Ergonomically, as I've already covered, I love having this dial that I can get to, but what's odd is I have to reach forward to get to this dial. The RP is superior because the dial goes off the edge in the back so I can run it like this. With this, I have to lean forward with my finger. Weird, but true. The in-hand feel and the menu system are the best. This is a real camera designed by real ergonomic designers. You'll notice that the angles of everything are just right to fit my hands and fingers. There are no sharp edges on this. Sony is the worst and Fuji is close. Fuji and Sony cameras have hard, sharp edges, which if it's a piece of stereo equipment is okay because you're not holding it all day long. It just sits on a shelf. For something you have to have in your hand, it needs to be very organic. It needs to be rounded and smooth and fit the way our hands move and our bones move and our joints move, which this camera has done. Everything is comfortable to hold. It's not something that looks cool sitting on a shelf, but feels horrible having to hold all day long. To use the menus, you can do it with the touch screen or use the thumb nubbin or, or pff, use the dials. You can use it your choice. It has a touch screen for entering text, which I use for entering my copyright information. But I do have to be kind of careful with my big American fingers. It's not the best. It's not like an iPhone, which has a much larger screen. I kind of like the rear four-way controllers of the lesser cameras, as opposed to having to go between this and this to do one thing or the other. But that's just me. I never did like the function bar of the EOS R, so I actually prefer this nubbin as opposed to that. What's interesting is although the autofocus boxes are green in one shot IF, they're blue when you're tracking at servo AF, which struck me as a little weird. But those are the worst things I can say about this camera when it comes to ergonomics. And you know how I go off on Sony and Fuji for their horrible ergonomics. The finder is big, sharp, and clear. There's no blackout. And when you're shooting at ultra high frame rates with the electronic shutter, it'll blink a gray rectangular border around the image, which is very subtle, just enough to let you know that the camera actually fired because otherwise there's no vibration, there's no sound. You wouldn't know that the camera had fired. This has got state-of-the-art flash performance, which easily runs at 12 frames per second if your flash can hold up that fast. And it's got 250th of a second sync, which is state-of-the-art. I don't use any of the high-speed sync options because I don't believe in them because I'm shooting fill flash and the high-speed sync options waste a lot of flash power, which doesn't let me do what I'm trying to do for that. High ISO performance is great compared to the R5. The R5 is just as good. The R5 actually has more detail. This R6 goes to higher ISOs because the computer is able to noise reduction process the images because they're of a lower resolution. But ultimately, you can set this a stop higher than the R5. It looks a stop worse than the R5. So here are full frame images shot at the various ISOs, and they look pretty much identical, which is excellent. If you can get every ISO to look the same, that's all we ask. And the key is even at the very highest ISOs, it still looks pretty good. The first thing you'll notice it's not right is by around 51,200, you're getting a little bit of green magenta blobs or modeling in the colors, as you can see on the fireplace mantle. At 102,000, the modeling is becoming a little more obvious. And at 204,800, it looks pretty awful. That's also the H setting, which is a hint. You're getting color modeling, you're getting a lot of grain, and the shadows aren't even that dark. But ultimately, if you need to use it for the full image, seen at normal sizes like this, go right ahead. If we use these 9.1 times magnifications, these are 600 by 450 pixel crops. Just looking at details here, what you're going to see is the sharpest is at ISO 50, and it becomes progressively softer at every ISO, which is the way every camera works because the noise reduction is smoothing over the details at the same time as smoothing over the noise. Noise reduction tries to be as smart as it can and, and figure out the difference between details and noise, but let's face it, it doesn't know which the noise is and which the image is. So it's trying to do its best job at guessing. And this is what it does. 
You'll notice the finest details start disappearing at higher ISOs, even though the biggest shapes are still there. And when you get to the highest ISO, you can see if you're zooming in really far like this, which is equivalent to making a huge print, it is very noisy. But that's not news. The key is it works. If we look at the shadows, this is the fireplace grate. Again, the same 9.1 times magnification. These are 600 by 450 pixel crops from the full images. You'll notice at ISO 50, we have the most definition. And at every progressively higher ISO from 100 and up, the screen, the fine screen starts disappearing. When we get to higher ISOs, the bricks in the back, by around ISO 3200, 6400, the bricks in the back are gone. At higher ISOs, then we lose the screen as well, and all we can see is the large curly cues. By ISO 51,000, there's almost nothing there except noise and curly cues. At ISO 102,000, that's really almost nothing. And at ISO 204,000, it's just noise in the shadows, which we kind of knew. And here's why you shouldn't worry too much about that. The reason you shouldn't worry too much about that is that the shadows shouldn't be your whole picture. If you're taking pictures of just shadows, use more exposure. So <laughs> that's what it does. That's what we expect. It works well. Admittedly, people don't realize the higher resolution cameras actually retain more detail at these super high ISOs. There's not that much metal on the outside of this camera. What's metal is the strap lugs, the hot shoe, the lens mount, the, the pivot for the car door, which is that little thing, but the rest of the car door is plastic. The battery door hinge pivot and the tripod socket are metal. Everything else is plastic. All these knobs, buttons, controls, top panels, and everything are plastic. The back of the camera is plastic. All the doors are plastic. Everything's plastic. And rubbery plastic is this IP shield and the grip coverings. These connector covers look okay when they're brand new. The problem is, is they get older. They're just plastic, rubbery plastic, and they feel okay when they're new, but eventually they break off. And by the time 10 years goes by, these may fall off completely. Then you have no protection. But as a digital camera, I don't know if you're going to be using it 10 years. And here are the connections. Microphone, headphone, three and a half millimeters. You've got a two and a half millimeter control for a wired remote, as well as you can use the app for that, free app via Bluetooth. You've got USB-C and HDMI. Battery life is great. I can go hundreds and hundreds of shots, just like it's rated piddling around where I make one shot, look at the, <laughs> look at the playback, make a shot, look at the playback. If I shoot continuous sports where I'm just going along and not looking at playback every single time, I can get thousands of shots. The EOS R5 is rated for less shots than this EOS R6. And here's a screenshot from my EOS R5 after shooting some sports. And this is with a third-party Watson battery. You'll notice I made 1,400 shots, and I only used 8% of the total charge of the battery, which means if you do the math, I'd probably get about 18,000 shots with just shooting continuously for sports. So battery life is just fantastic. And that's it. This is the world's most practical high-speed digital full-frame mirrorless camera. The R5 is wonderful if you can afford it. By all means, I would say get it. But I prefer having this little dial like this. And if you're really going to be shooting at high speeds, you don't want all the extra pixels. Now, that sounds silly. If you're a consumer or someone who spends most of his time working a regular job and doesn't shoot every single day for a living, you may say, oh, I wish I had those pixels. No, and you actually have to deal with those pixels and take care of those pixels and curate those pixels. Having 20 good megapixels is more than enough and helps everything go so much faster and archive it than having to deal with double the pixels in the R5. Admittedly, you can take the R5 and you can set the resolution down, but then the question is, why did you buy the R5? So for high-speed shooting, for general nature landscapes, this is great. If you want more pixels than just a lightweight camera and you're only photographing things that don't move, then the EOS RP is another favorite for only $999 or less. It's got slightly more resolution than this, and it's lighter, and the picture quality is also superb. It only runs at one quarter the speed and can't track autofocus as quickly, but for things that don't move, that's another great choice. So the good news is, is everything from Canon is a great choice. It all depends on your interests. This is a camera ideal for shooting sports in action, as well as general purpose photography. If you like what you're seeing, of course you can subscribe, but my biggest source of support is when you use the links from my online reviews at KenRockwell.com or the links in my descriptions here to get your gear. When you get your gear, that's what helps support me, and that's my biggest source of funding for doing all these free videos. I've been using the people to whom I link in these for decades, and that's why I recommend them so highly. I got my R6 and my R5 from B&H, who are fantastic. I've been buying from them since the 1970s, when I was in junior high school. They've always treated me right, which is why I've always supported them long before the internet even went commercial. So long before YouTube, long before Google, long before Amazon, B&H has been there. 
and they've always helped me out, which is why I recommend them so strongly. Thanks again for watching KenRockwell.com here on KenRockwell.tv.